suit and tie And get your hair cut way up high Get yourself a lawyer, son You're gonna need a real good one David Whiting is your talkback lawyer and he's here to dispense wisdom and advice. Give me a call, one three hundred triple two seven seven four. David, good morning. Good morning, Virginia. Nice to see you. You um, well, I can actually see you through several sanitising panes of glass. Yes, so I won't get anything from you and you won't get anything from me. So to speak. Yes. Got a tip on the cup for us? I knew someone would ask that. The, um, the, the only horse I like, and I, sorry, I... I would normally be at the Cup today. Would you? Uh, oh. um, it was something that my family did. We always went to the races. Okay. So I would... Uh, this is the first in 24 Melbourne wow. Cup days that I've been here. Right? Um, I, uh, the one... But I've just... Uh, I'm an omen punter. I just I go for the social rather than for the, the betting. Uh, I think it's Albion... Oh, it's Stratum? I yep. have no idea what its prospects are, but, you know, it was a name that I I'll liked. I'll grab the so form guide and have a look at it for you. <laughs> 11 to 1, I think it was. 11 to 1, that's quite good. Well, yep. here, so you'll actually put some money on it, will you? Yeah, I will put some money on it. Oh, dear. We're not encouraging gambling. Stand down, everyone, stand down. But do call him because uh, David doesn't have any homework, do you, for no, this week? No, no homework. Free and clear. Any news you'd like to share with me? Well, I had a hypothetical for you, uh, Virginia. I love hypotheticals. Uh, here's the scenario. A tradesman does some work. He takes an app out on his phone and he creates the invoice and he sends it to the project manager who prints it off, who delivers it to the client and the client then pays to the bank account shown on the invoice. Unfortunately, at some point, the bank shown account, account shown on the invoice is not the bank account of the tradesman who did the work. I've paid the money on an invoice. Have I discharged my obligation to pay? Yes. Is that a yes you have? So you're talking here about the client who got the work done for them? They yes. paid the bill. Have they discharged their obligation? Yes, even though the per, the tradesman says someone has changed the bank account on the invoice. Yes, no. You, you've, you've, uh, it wasn't your responsibility to check that the person who wrote the invoice put the right, ba- right bank account on it. No, I, 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 I'm inclined to agree with you, but the real question then becomes is who and when, who, by whom and when was the bank account changed? And I just uh, and it was all done with an online billing app. Yeah. So at what point? It, it, it can happen, um, and it's interesting with a lot of us having got home delivered goods during pandemic. I realised that I had to be very careful too, because you'd you'd call up a page and it would default to whatever you had put in. You know the last. Uh, reference, for example, yes. this is a slightly different example, but parallel. And if you didn't go in and check, your goods might end up being delivered to the last person you delivered something to, in one case, my mother. So she received some face masks, so that's oh. good. I'm glad she got them, but they are actually for me. Uh, uh, so it's the same thing. When you pull it up, you've got to check. Now, hang on a minute. It, yes, it, has it, it gone to the right place? Well, yeah. uh, in the last two years, there have been huge issues in property settlements. Mm. where there's been a redirection of a payment. Someone has broken into an email and redirected a payment. So the advice they give to lawyers and conveyances now is that if you get, always check the bank account by telephone in addition to receiving it by email. Oh, interesting. There you go. And it's good advice to all of us to double check any any of those things. It's what you learn in journalism, although it doesn't mean you still can't fall down. You do. one three hundred triple two seven seven four. Okay, let's answer some questions and get you some advice. Graham is oh no, Graham's not quite um, available at the moment. So let me just go to Brett in Robinvale. Brett, good morning. You're talking this morning to David. Yeah, I've uh, uh, got a case going in Brisbane in the Family Law Courts, and uh, I can't get. I don't seem to be able to get a permit to travel to Queensland from Northern Victoria, where we've had no cases, and we're a regional town of uh, Northern Victoria, um, border town, and we share the same supermarket as New South Wales. Have you been knocked back for a permit? Uh, they told me it was three thousand dollars. As soon as the, the court case is over, I have to fly back. So, and you have to do some quarantine as well, do you, Brett? Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, yeah it's, so it's about three thousand dollars for the day just to go and represent myself. It's a Queensland government requirement. They're the ones you should talk to. How long? How far away is your case? Uh, I, I'm trying to put the papers in to, for the appeal of the decision that I got on the nineteenth of December. You know, I believe I only had twenty eight days. I've just continuously been in, hosp- in St Vincent's Hospital, having to travel with public transport down there. Yep. And um, 
So you're applying to appeal out of time as well, are you? Yes. Well, I'm, yes. I imagine that what I've, you'll I've do... Lost me, um, I've lost my representation from Victoria. Yes. Because I don't represent you in... Uh, legal, I don't represent you in uh, Queensland. So yes. They've, they've turned, turned the case back to a lay man. OK, Brett, uh, it's a Queensland government issue. If you're, you, Your issue is you can file by paper and you can file electronically. You just need to hope that your hearing date is after the borders are opened. OK. And, yeah. and you might also see that there are quite a few court cases being done electronically, so it might be possible to do a Zoom connection or, a, you know, an, an online viewing connection, which would cost you a lot less than $3,000. OK, then. No worries. Good luck. Thank you, Brett. Brett, thanks for calling in. Good to hear from you. Nick is in Lilydale. Hi, Nick. Ah, oh, no, Nick's... Uh, I think Nick's in the middle of chatting. Sorry about that. Andrew in Blackburn. How can we help? Andrew, good morning. Hi. Are you there? Yes. Hi, go ahead. Um, some time ago, I found myself at the police station after um, an incident of self-harm. Um, while I was there, before I was interviewed, I noticed on the wall there was a notice about... Um, independent third persons for people who had certain conditions, including mental illness. Yes. Um, I asked if I could have such a person. Um, the person interviewing me said, oh, I don't know anything about that. Um, and I said, basically, well, it's up there on the wall. Um, the sergeant came out and um, he said, uh, well, I'm not sure about that. And... Um, at this time of night, I don't think we'll be able to get money in anyway. So, so, you're, so your, op your option in practical terms was, Andrew, was that you would either... Three choices, I suppose they would let you go and bring you back for an interview later, or they would hold you until such time such a person came, or the third option would be that you would waive your right to have that person there and be interviewed. What ended up happening? Um, you know, I wasn't feeling pretty great and I want to get out of the place so I basically agreed to join the interview. Yes. Um, and after that I basically felt like well I probably shouldn't have been in the interview I should have basically sort of um, Lots of people do said, police interviews and think that Andrew. Yep. Yeah but basically I think I should have just kept quiet and did yes. a no comment interview. Yes. And um, yeah I'm not quite sure where I stand now, my solicitor said that it's done and dusted, there's not, nothing you can do about oh, it. There, absolutely not. There is nothing you can do about it. Uh, the, there will be a transcript of the interview that will be taken into account. So it, if, you're, if you've got well, any concerns at a police interview, then you, you, you no comment. Andrew, okay, did, did, you, did, you, so did you say things that you regret now or that were not true? Um, yes. Yeah, OK. Well, uh, how but he, uh, I guess there's nothing in the transcript that says I asked for and was not given the option of having an independent. No, I, no. I get that. And uh, that's perhaps something that you ought to have considered at the time. But you know, we've, as the as your solicitor has said, you're done and dusted. You've already had your chance. But and Andrew was having a hard time. It was an issue of self harm that he'd gone in. For, oh yeah, so, I understand. Yeah, so he, yeah, so you, he clearly weren't, well, you weren't in that stress. mental place. Andrew, no. talk, talk to your solicitor about it. Maybe, maybe there's things that can be said in, in court when it actually goes to court, when yeah. it appears. And, and you might also be able to get some kind of concession from the sergeant on duty or the interviewer that, in fact, uh, there was a request made and you proceeded because one wasn't available. Oh, and also that you're in that state of distress. Good luck, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for calling in. Graham's called in from Frankston with an eternal issue. Hi, Graham. Yes, uh, hello, uh uh, Virginia and David. David, uh, <coughs> I live uh, in Frankston South on a large leafy block uh, facing south in the front of my block. My uh, neighbour on the north has very, three very large trees in his backyard, 10 metres plus that overshadow the back of my block. Um, that's a nuisance, but there's not much I can do about that. But that's the amount of debris and falling branches that cause uh, uh, occasional damage to garden sheds and carport roofs and things like that. Yes. So uh, I've been here for seven years and uh, I, uh, I went round to see them last week um, to uh, to discuss the issue about the neighbour taking some responsibility and for does, pruning the trees, perhaps. Graeme, does that mean you've got seven years of branches and leaves? I haven't collected them no, all, no. Okay. I've, got, I've disposed of most of them. But it has the, the, the actual fence, which is not a proper fence, it's a brush fence, but it is in my property by about one foot, so there's there's no actual joint boundary on the boundary yes. and falling branches have damaged that fence 
Uh, regardless, so I went to see the uh, the gentleman to see uh, to, to say hello and discuss what the options were and to find out the house was for sale and he indeed had been sold. Yes. And, and uh, he, he said, well, uh, hello, how are you going? Uh, uh, talk to the new owners in four weeks' time. Right. So uh, I wonder what my options are. Well, the neighbour who's there at the moment is responsible for what's for, for the leaves and branches that have currently dropped and haven't been picked up. Um, if you're the owner of the property, then the person, sorry, the person who's settling the property in four weeks' time will own the trees and the leaves and the branches. Yeah. So the owner at that point will be responsible for any damage that happens after the date of settlement. Yes. But for any damage that causes be that occurs before the date of settlement is the responsibility of the person who owns the property now. Yeah, so if, if, he, if he doesn't cooperate and given... You know, now only three weeks to settlement. Uh, should I notify the real estate agent that the new owners need to have an issue, forth will have a forthcoming issue? Um, but it's a different issue. So if you yeah. imagine there's a storm this afternoon and there are branches dropped on your property, that's yeah. not the new buyer's problem. That's the current owner's problem. Yeah. So your claim against the new owners is only in respect of something that happens after you settle, not before. Okay, so uh, um, one of the issue, main problems is getting trees pruned to avoid further damage. Um, I, I, I think in my mind that's a claim that you would bring against the new owner. Sure. And I sort of, I know it's not a terribly friendly response, but hey, I'm your neighbour to the south. Those beautiful trees on your property are causing me damage. Can we talk about how it might be managed? Maybe not on day one. Yeah, oh, no, no, definitely not on day one. <laughs> not on right? day one. Whatever no. you do. Okay. All right. Graham, yeah. you're going okay. around there with a, with a box of brownies that you've baked first. Uh, then yeah. you're having the discussion about the trees, OK? All right. And, oh, and, and you have a bigger problem too, Graham. You've also got the problem that you need to remind them that the fence doesn't mark the boundary between your property and theirs. Yeah. Yes. All right? Which, I'll, uh, I'll do that. Yes. That's, Good luck. That, that's, right, that's, that's, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. Always worthwhile getting that surveyed and doing it right on the boundary, correct? Or, or putting something on the boundary. A marker. You know, it might be a row of bricks or it might be something which says this is the boundary. Yeah. Uh, but then how do you get in to mow your one foot of lawn between the marker and the brush <laughs> fence? <laughs> and they'll start complaining yes. about that one foot of lawn, won't they? Of course yep. they will. Uh, Damien is in Ballarat. Good morning. What's going on? Yeah. Good morning, Virginia. Good morning, David. Uh, I just a townhouse, uh, an adjoining one uh, to my neighbour, and our back garage wall marks the boundary. On the other side, there's an easement, uh, which is not our property, but water enters my neighbour's garage and it seeps into mine. His garage gets more or less flooded out by ankle-deep water. Uh, council don't seem to be interested in helping out at all. I'm just wondering what my options are. Whose water is it, Damien? It's the neighbour's coming rainwater. Then you would have a claim against the neighbour? Well, this is what I was thinking. I, I didn't want to go to that extent. We're trying to work it out, but uh, I was trying to get it to stop. But the water's coming in from uh, two houses down at the back. Not from. It originally originates from there because the land is 180 millimetre above the slab. And this is what's causing the problem. Oh, I, so, sorry, is the problem with your build, is it? So your slab is too low? Well, going from what I can see, yes. The slope has been on the easement side, on the neighbours at the back, they've built up the ground when they, or the developers built up the ground uh, very high. Then you have an action against the, well, you've got a mixed action against the person who's not keeping their water on their property and also against the, the person who did the construction work. But how long ago was that done? Uh, I think it could have been four to five years. Well, I'd get moving because you'll have a limitation of six years. And, yeah. And your problem's going to be proving what the natural level of the surface was before they did the work. Yeah, well, so, I uh, don't that might be the case. Under the Water Act, there are issues yeah. where you change the natural surface of the water, and so what you're doing yeah. is you're affecting water flows. Well, well how, if, I have, if I can solve the problem by, by putting in a French trench at the back, how do I go about... What legal rights have I got to do that? Well, none, because it's on someone else's property. Yeah, that's what I thought. That yeah. doesn't mean you can't come along to them and say, I've got both the problem and the solution and it won't cost you any money. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, 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 I, I that has a certain not, appeal. Because I can't get any help from council whatsoever about the storm drain, you know. No, yeah. Yeah. They're Understood. not interested.
All yeah. right. Thanks for right. calling in. Good to hear from you. Jordan the Arborist has texted in this morning, David, and says, perennial problem. A lot of our work is fence line trimming, constantly being complained about from neighbours, nonstop, says Jordan the Arborist. Oh, well, it's a business opportunity. Well, I mean, but also it's such an easily solved problem. Just keep your fence line trimmed. Uh Yes, but as trees get bigger, the canopies get bigger. Mm. I mean, I've seen some court cases in Camberwell over um, 80-year-old pine trees, and which are and, and there are some kinds of gums which like to shed branches frequently. Sure. The 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 the, the problem is is that you you plant your tree too close to the fence line to keep the whole of the canopy in the fence line. Mm. That's right. No, look, I, I know, and I just. We think should just go for pencil pine. <laughs> is that what you think? <laughs> straight, straight up. Yes. No, no horizontal. Also, be careful what you wish for in terms of you know planting a tree and praying and hoping that it turns out to be big and shady because one day it will. Yes. With all those problems, Nick is in Lilydale. Hello, Nick. Uh, good morning, <clears throat> Virginia and David. Um, I've got a, a query on the um, chairperson of a body corporate uh, committee of a complex in. Queensland, and the management rights uh, of that complex were bought by a company <clears throat> several years back, um, but I'm having trouble engaging with the company over contractual matters um, because they have appointed an on-site representative, like an on-site manager, yes, um, but a representative of the company, and they say just deal with their on-site representative. Yes. Um, but I don't believe that the money that we've been um, paying them, the company under the contract, uh, is being passed on sufficiently to the on-site representatives to maintain the complex. But Nick, it's up to Virginia in Queensland. The ownership rights in strata buildings is a really interesting market. You know, particularly at things like the Gold Coast, where. Mm. Uh, there are hundreds of units and, and somebody needs to be there and manage it so it's not like we have here with six or seven people all living in a, in a single building. So, Nick, the, um, they're entitled to appoint whoever they want to represent them. So it's not your choice as the chairman of the Owners Corporation to decide who their representative ought to be. So you should simply treat the, with the Owners Corporation, with the on-site manager, as if he or she was the um, was the company and and you know it may well be that you're off to a small claims or because they have an owners corporation type list in the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal there may be a dispute that you run there and at that point you'll end up with talking to somebody other than the manager all right <clears throat> so it's just that the monies that we pay um, <clears throat> to the company doesn't seem to be being passed on to the on-site managers to do the duties of the caretaking agreement. Oh no, so the issue then really is that the work you're paying to get done isn't getting done? That's right, yep. Okay, well that's the complaint. It's not a complaint about the money's not being passed on, it's the work's not being done. And that's a matter under your contract that you can take to the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal. Good luck. And at that point you'll end up talking it with either the company that owns the rights or the lawyers acting for them. Right. Right. So you just continue to um, talk to the on-site representatives, yes. not, not the owners of well, the Well, you talk to the person they nominate, who's the on-site representative, until such time as you take the matter to a tribunal and, and at that point they'll appoint somebody else to represent them. Nick, good luck with that. Thanks for joining us today. Now, there's another Queensland question here. Here we are. Graham's called in from um, Dunnelly. Graham, hi. How are you going? Good. Good. Yeah, it was interesting to hear what you said before about the um, the property owner with the branches falling over and it all being the the uh, vendor's responsibility until settlement. Because I've just had um, a couple of friends bought a house up in Brisbane, and well, a few days before settlement, big rainstorm came through, damaged the ceiling, and apparently it was their responsibility in Queensland. And I. No, I, we're, I we're, talking, we're talking about different things, Graham. Um, and mm. I don't know what the Queensland... I've, in Victoria, what happens is this, is the vendor is obliged to deliver the property in the same mm. condition as it was at the time of sale, fair wear and tear accepted. 
So if yeah. there was, uh, if the, the roof broke or there was a ceiling flood or any of those things, they need to be fixed by the vendor. Yes. Yeah, uh, I, I did wonder if it was outside of your jurisdiction. No, no, of no, no. That, that, that's the principle. What we're talking yeah. about with the trees is that the point I made was that all of the damage caused by the trees up to the date of settlement, caused by yep. the trees to, to uh, Graham's property, were yep. the responsibility of the current owner. Yes. But my difficulty is yep. going to be that that's a very small amount and doesn't really deal with Graham's problem yes. and yes. or the no, Frankston the, South problem. So the the issue up there was the, the rain, you know, there was a roof leak or something, the bedroom ceiling's almost fallen in uh, two or three days before they're ready to move into their main bedroom. Okay. Graham, let me give you a was, parallel in Melbourne. Let's assume mm. that in the Frankston South property a large branch fell Yep. That would be the problem of the current owner and would have to make it good. It wouldn't be the new person's problem. Mm. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thanks for calling in. Our number is 1300 222 774. I can fit in perhaps one or two more. Uh, Stephen in Western Victoria. Ah, where are you? There you are. Good morning. Good morning, Virginia and David. How are you? Well, good, thanks. Good. Listen, um, just a, this is a bit of a strange one. But there was so can you come closer course. to your phone, Stephen? I was involved in a building dispute. Stephen, we uh, still can't hear you very well. Can you pick it up? Yep. There you go. Go That's ahead. Better? Yep. Yep. I was involved in a building dispute um, about 2012. I was uh, sued by a client and um, it went to the county court and there was 25 days of court hearings over a period of three years um, and eventually there was an out-of-court settlement uh, reached. Um, the, the building dispute was between... Um, a builder, myself um, being a builder, and uh, another company involved in the building, and the plaintiff was the one that took us to court. Now, the question is, that was settled out of court, and the plaintiff was um, received a settlement that they were obviously happy with because they settled. Um, now, several years later, they are pursuing matters again with um, a subcontractor that worked on that, that project, and I believe they're in breach of the settlement claim, uh, uh, settlement payment. Um, is there a recourse or is there precedence for people that breach settlements? And do I have a, a possibility of an action in recovering some of the settlement payment that I paid, which was substantial? Uh, no, you wouldn't have any. And it, the question will really be whether or not the, your terms of settlement had the effect of causing the other claim to go away. It may well be that that claim got rolled in. So all of the work done under the building contract might be covered by your terms of settlement. Yep. Uh, and you might come along and say, well, you're prepared to get that advice, but, uh, or it may be that you... The problem is your terms of settlement will be confidential, won't they? Yep, yep. Uh, you could tell the building contractor that your terms of settlement, that you settled your dispute. Yep. And if there's going to be discovery in the claim that the plaintiff, the owner, has against the subcontractor, you might he might ask for discovery of that document. But you can't and tell him what's in it. got to that stage. But my question is, what is the point of someone, say, with the benefit of hindsight, what was the point of me settling this out of court when, when this is a possibility that someone else who was you know, closely involved and, and I would argue was um, working for me at the time um, and should have been covered in that settlement the way the wording is, I believe it, it was That depends upon the settlement. case that was being run, okay, Steve. Uh, so it would depend upon the wording of the proceeding and the wording yeah. of the terms of settlement. So, okay. Yeah, so back to my question, does so anyone very, ever... Very quickly now. So does anyone ever get, like, anyone who breaches that settlement? So if they are clearly in breach of that settlement of agreement... If you want to get the terms of settlement set aside, be prepared to run the case. Run the case entirely? Yes. Yep, OK. We'll have to leave it there, but thanks for calling us, Stephen. We wish you luck with all of that. David, uh, great to have you on board and great to see you again well, after so many months. Nice to be back. The pandemic has treated you well. Indeed. The four months away has been good for me. Yeah, it's very, very good. He's dying to get back to the office? He is, indeed, yes. David Whiting there, back with you again next week.